really just, it was a testament to how bad we wanted it. Them dudes just was want, they just really wanted to see how, how much we was willing to go extremely hard to secure the win. And they wanted to see how much we was willing to sacrifice to secure the win. And with all of that being said, Chuck D said, yo, that Chilo Ski name ain't the shit if you're, if you're gonna be leaders of the new school. You gotta lead the new. So you can't have no old ass sounding name, my nigga. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> nigga came through, cause they used to always ask me to bust around too. Why don't you bust around for this nigga? Cause they used to love seeing the animation and the aggressive shit. And nigga Chuck D one day he's like, yo, you remind me of this football player named Buster Rhymes. He used to play for the Minnesota Vikings in 1985. I think he was a wide receiver. And I was like, word? The nigga brought the, 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 the card with the fucking athlete on the card. And his name was Buster Rhymes with an ER. And I looked at that shit and I said, this shit is L, yo. A real dude named Buster Rhymes that played for the Minnesota Vikings. So I took his exact name, B-U-S-T-E-R. Never met him. Then when time started to pass, cause I ain't like the name at first, but I thought it was dope. But I just was so much on my, I changed from Chilo Ski to Lord Taheem cause me being 5%, that was my attribute as 5%. But it wasn't nothing unique about it because they had so many other guards with their names as they MC name, like Kim Shabazz and King Sun and you know, Lord Jamal from the brand Nubian. Everybody had this, you know, so when Chuck said be Buster Rhymes, he was like, just try it. If you don't like it, you can go back to all of them names you got. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I gave it a shot. And probably like a year or two of them bringing us to shows and letting us open up for them. They had a lady named Jessica Rosenblum. Hun, Amanda Shear Demi. Amanda Shear Demi is the widowed wife of Ted Demi who created Yo! MTV Raps. They used to run shit in the downtown area with the clubs. And that's how we was able to perform as leaders of the new school and get the buzz going. And Dante Ross, who was that Tommy boy who signed De La Soul in him, he saw us at a club in the Lower East Side called Payday one time. And he was leaving Tommy boy to go to Electra. And the motherfucker was like, y'all so incredible, I wanna sign y'all. But all of that grooming in the two, three years of being able to go out with Chuck and them, and get that schooling and be able to ask questions and learn how to really perform all of that shit. It was like the boot camp training that we needed before we started getting in these clubs and getting seen. And all of that shit is what provided the opportunity to get the deal. So Buster Moms was born December 15th, 1989, when I was 17 years old. Mm. After being Chelo Ski. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna let you lay that one down. <laughs> Breakout, uh, you broke out solo career. What was the process of your debut album, your debut album, the coming and putting together? Woo ha! Got you all in check. Talk so, about that. So, so I was scared to go solo. I was super nice with doing the features. And Why I, were you scared? I was scared because I was never a solo MC. I was always in a group. I was responsible for my 16 bars. And, get and out then the I way. was out the fucking way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When you gotta do three 16s yeah. in the chorus for 12 to 14 records, yeah, that's a lot. that shit is a weight. And then you ain't got nobody to really bounce no ideas off of. I'm used to having Brown and Dinko around. I bounce the ideas off of having a nigga tell me, yo, this shit dope, that shit ain't it. Yo, tweak these two, three bars over here. And who I did have those relationships with, like a Q-tip or you know, dayline them. I, I was they was busy, so I didn't I, I didn't have the same access to them that I would have with my own crew. The thing was though, what, that forced me to figure it out was, as the youngest member of the group, I was the first one to have a child, so I had to find my way to provide for my child. So that's when I kind of started ODing with the features and rhyming on everybody's shit, and I used the buzz from scenario to sell myself and solicit myself to make sure that I ended up on everybody's records because I had to find verse money to keep taking care of my kids until I figured out what I was doing as a solo artist. Once I got to the solo artist opportunity, I remember there's a skit after It's a Party if you listen to the album sequence in its full form, right? And uh, 
in the skit, it's like you hear this band like just randomly playing their instruments, like they fine tuning their instruments. And I acknowledge that. And then I do some little short ass freestyle. That was the very first thing that I recorded for the first solo album. And it happened like that because I was shooting Higher Learning movie at the time. I get the call from Dante Ross. And he told me, because when they did the deal initially, they signed us as individuals as well as a group. So when we broke up, we still were stuck at the label. So he telling me that I'm getting a budget that was way more than what we got for each leader's album. And I ain't had to split that shit with nobody. I was excited than a motherfucker about that. But I wasn't excited about the solo artist responsibility. I called Q-Tip. He come to LA, fuck with me. And we go in the studio. I think we went in like three days straight. I couldn't come up with nothing. I'm angry than a motherfucker. And then this, this brother named Rashad Smith, Tumbling Dice, he produced the One More Chance remix for Biggie. Mm -hmm. um, he produced Doing It Well for LL. He produced Wuha Got You On In Check. He produced Dangerous for me as well. The Wuha sample was played in a Rampage session. Rampage was working on a song and I think Rashad needed a, a horn sample for this beat. He ended up pulling out the Galt McDermott shit, which is the sample for the Wuha shit from the hair Broadway play soundtrack. When he plays this shit, I'm like, nigga, keep that for me. That shit crazy, my nigga. He make the beat, he loop it. I'm riding around in the whip. First week pass, I don't come up with nothing. Two, three weeks pass, I don't come up with nothing. A whole month pass, I don't come up with nothing. Two, three months pass, I don't come up with nothing. Four, five, six months pass, I don't come up with nothing. By the seventh month, and I got sued by telling this story on Jay Leno. <laughs> I never cleared the sample. And I think Sylvia Robinson's son, he sued me because I told on myself, trying to give credit. So I'm already paying for it. <laughs> so you can tell it now. So I can tell it again. Freely. Rest in peace to Sylvia Robinson's son too, because he passed away shortly after he was in the room with me while I was forced to make a deposition. But in any event, Red Alert was doing the old school at noon on Hot 97. He plays the eighth wonder record by the Sugar Hill Gang. And the wrong, the wrong, that's the wrong, my neck. Woo ha, got you all in check. Uh, let's scream, uh, let's shout, uh, let's turn this function now to keep keeping on. I heard that shit. I called Rashad. I said, I got it. Meet me in the studio tonight. Went to the studio. Made that shit the hook. Wrote the verses on the spot, song done. We put the shit out, that shit went platinum in six weeks. When I started to see the money from them shows and the money from them royalties and the publishing deals and all that shit, I said, I like this solo shit. And I like the responsibility of a being a solo artist. <laughs> and if the shit takes seven months to write but pay like this, fuck it. <laughs> Let's keep it going. But you know, once you taste a steak coming from canned food, bro, that motherfucking taste bud and that palate change. It's like my whole way of thinking started to change. And you know, I'm taking care of my family. I'm watching baby mom's smile get bigger. I'm watching my mom's smile get bigger. And that's the first thing I did with the success of that, told my mom's quit a job. And once she quit a job and helped me run the rest of my shit, that's probably the most rewarding feeling that I have because that's the first thing I did. Like before I bought myself jewelry and cars and all of that, I took care of my mom's because she signed my deal when I was 17. I could have woke up one day and did some shit to piss her ass off. It would have never been a Busta <laughs> Rhyme signature on that contract. And then y'all would have never knew me and I'd have never been sitting here with all the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, big up to mom Dukes. Yeah, that's, that's dope. Right.